Hey, you. You want to animate? You got Clip Studio Paint? Good, good. Some people aren't aware that Clip Studio Paint actually supports animation, and it's actually really good at it. I actually think it's fairly straightforward for anybody who's inexperienced with animation, looking to do frame by frame, and they'll actually find it fairly approachable once they understand the basics. The first half of this tutorial will show you how to set up with animating, and the second half will show you how to actually make it better. Also for this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you at least know how to use Clip Studio Paint on a basic level, and that maybe you know what a vector layer is, not necessarily if you use them. They're not mandatory for animation, but they do help a whole lot, just trust me on this. Oh, and before you ask, yes, this will work in Clip Studio Paint Pro. Pro's only limitation with animation is that it's only limited to 24 frames. You can do a lot with 24 frames. At 12 FPS, this is going to be 2 seconds of animation. While you won't be making a full-length cartoon with that kind of limitation, 2 seconds will often be enough to get through several kinds of shots, as well as is more than enough for most kinds of GIF animations. And if you're animating at a slower frame rate, you can go even further. Go to Window, Timeline, Show the Timeline. I like to dock mine at the bottom of the screen. You might like to put yours at the top of the screen. Just put it somewhere where you can actually see it. On the Timeline panel, click the New Timeline button. A timeline basically will track all the timings of the content on your project file. Because I'm limited to doing window capture, I can't actually show the dialog box that comes up, but when you click this button, it'll ask you how long you want your animation to be, what frame rate you want, etc. I wouldn't ever go above 24 FPS personally for frame by frame, and I actually recommend using 12 FPS unless you know you need something faster or even slower. These blue bars on the side of the timeline show how long this animation is. They might be different colored depending on what version of CSP you're using. By default, whenever you make a new layer, it will show up for the full duration of the animation. And you'll notice, just like with the duration bars, you can drag the duration of every single individual layer to shorten or lengthen them. Now I know what you're thinking. Your first instinct is you're going to draw several layers and then change their timings here, shrinking them down to one frame each, and proceeding that way. No. Don't do that. You will die. Instead, we're going to use something called Animation, animation folders. folders. If the reverb didn't make that obvious, animation folders are extremely important for CSP animation. Over on the Timeline view, there should be this button here called New Animation Folder. Click it. Animation folders are specially designed folders that can only have one element visible at a time, and wowie gee, go figure, they're specifically designed for animating. Upon making one, the other three buttons will also become visible. And these are the New Animation Cell button. This creates a new labeled drawing in the animation folder in question, making it visible at the current time. This basically syncs it up with the current timeline as it's created. Specify Cell. This allows you to take a different cell inside of an animation folder and make it show up at the current time, linking it to that time. This is useful if you ever have a reused frame. And there's Delete Cell. This unlinks the currently selected frame. This does not delete the layer or drawing. It just removes it from the current timing. Naturally, Delete Cell can be undone by using the Specify Cell button. Any cells that you create inside the animation folder are going to show up on the timeline as long as they are synced, and you can move these little headers on the timeline itself to move them around and change their timings. Selecting an animation folder also enables use of the onion skin. Hopefully you should know what an onion skin does, but if you don't, it shows the previous and the next frame, so it's great for drawing in-betweens and making sure things line up and things like that. Anyway, cells are just drawings that appear inside the timeline. One huge advantage that all this has is when you have multiple cells in Clip Studio Paint, only one can be visible at any given time. If, in the layer view, you decide to click a different cell, it will immediately jump the playhead to that time on the timeline for you, and will display everything that is currently at that time. Likewise, if you click a cell on the timeline itself, it will jump to that layer in the layer panel as well. This makes for navigating around so much easier. You might also be thinking of some clever uses for this. I've definitely used this kind of mechanic, not for animation, but instead for making variants of various drawings and stuff like that. It has more applications than just animating. Now, if you're getting all confused by this, let me try to simplify it. All drawings exist at all times in Clip Studio Paint. They're all layers and things like that. Drawings are contained in layers, and then layers are considered to be cells when they are on the timeline. The timeline only tells them when they should be visible. Oh, and one final little bit, 
You can also add layers to the animation folder via the normal add layer buttons, and this also works for vector layers. They will label themselves appropriately as well. The key difference, however, is that they won't automatically sync up to the timeline, so you have to manually go in and specify them. It's one small extra step, but this actually is useful for making the very first layer a vector layer, which when you do that, whenever you click the new animation cell button, all preceding frames will be vector layers as well. They will copy what the previous one was. This will be useful for later. Now I'm going to be blunt here. One folder is not going to cut it. You can make multiple animation folders, and in fact, you should make multiple animation folders. Because in most cases, this will not just be helpful, it will be downright necessary. The basic general rule to follow is every element has its own animation folder. It's a sketch, put a folder. Line art, folder. Colors, folder. Shading, folder. This also applies when you have stuff that moves independently of the main timing. So you have all of the four aforementioned folders for a single character, but the arm is flying off doing something else in a different timing? Guess what? You need four more animation folders. Isn't that fun? It's gonna look very excessive, and usually animation is. You should see some of my old Flash projects. It's not gonna be pretty, but what is less pretty are the alternatives, which I'm not going to get into. Now you will see why complex shading and animation is not very popular. So yeah, you always want to try and minimize how many elements you need and how many frames you need. Spare yourself the headache. Simplify your work. Now, it is time to start animating. From here on out, I'm going to be working with examples. So anyway, as you can see, I've got my sketches all done, and now I'm going to start doing the line art. Once your sketches are done and you plan out your animation, which make sure you plan it out first, you can start doing your line art. As mentioned, I like to use vector layers for line art. So over in the line art folder, I'm going to click the new vector layer button and assign this to frame one, and then I'll move the playhead to the various times where there is a keyframe, which I have three keys in this animation, and I'm going to make frames two and three just using the new cell button, and they're automatically vector layers as you can see. I'm also going to assign frame one to another cell and then move that cell to the very end of the animation. This will come in play later when I'm doing in-betweens. The most important thing here is to focus on the keyframes of your animation before anything else. They are the most important frames in the timeline. They're your core poses, the ones that you work between, and the bare minimum that you need to understand the sense of motion. Once I get the first keyframe drawn, I can use onion skinning to make sure that I get the other ones lined up properly. Additionally, since I'm using vector layers, it's very easy for me to take components from other frames and move them onto other ones. This allows me to like make sure that my legs are very, very consistent and stay the same size, and it just saves me a whole lot of time because I don't have to fully redraw everything. This is actually the cornerstone of rigged animation, and rigged just takes this factor to 11. But I digress. With my keyframes done, my next step is to draw the in-betweens for these. Originally in the sketch, I had two in-betweens for each transition, but I decided that for this, because drawing frames is a whole lot of work, I'm going to stick to doing just one in-between for each transition. I would have maybe put more time into this if I wasn't streaming it at the time, but did you know that animation takes a long time? I've been doing this since 2012, and with demonstrating and talking about things and giving examples and only two hours of time to animate this thing, I couldn't really do a whole lot. This is often why I like to stick to rigged animations instead, but that's a whole other topic. Once my in-betweens are done, it's time for me to add in a few overshoot frames, which for these, instead of redrawing everything, I like to just duplicate another frame and then just move a few parts around. Overshoot is basically when you have something move into a position, it goes a little bit past where it needs to go and then it moves back finally. This also winds up shifting my keyframes over one in the timing, but that's not really a big deal. Anyway, the animation now looks fairly decent, even if it's just line work. Decent enough for a two-hour demonstration, anyway. Now is time for a invaluable tool, if it could even be called that. It is not so much a tool as much as it is a setting. It is the reference layer setting. I've done a video on vectors layers and how reference layers work. You might want to go watch that. But it's hugely useful for animation, because you need to work fast, you need to color very fast. This also has applications outside of animation that I mentioned earlier. You not only can set individual layers to reference, but you can set entire folders to reference, such as the line art animation folder. 
This will make it so all the layers inside will be referenced whenever you draw. However, only one is visible at a time. This means that you always are able to fill exactly what you need, and you will only reference one thing at a time despite having everything technically referenced. Over on our color layer, I'm going to make a new raster cell whenever we have a frame in the line art layer. With enough frames, this all just becomes a matter of filling in everything by your preferred coloring method. Mine obviously is using reference layers as I've mentioned before, so this goes very fast. Which is good, because I have a lot of colors that I have to put in here, so everything that can save you time, you should use. One other tip that I should mention while I'm here, you might know blending styles like normal overlay and multiply and things like that. If you want to use those for say shading, you can. By default however, folders in CSP are set to normal, which acts as if everything in the group has been flattened to normal before being sent down to the lower layers. If you want individual layers to have settings like multiply and things like that, you need to make sure that the folder itself is set to pass through. Alternatively, you can set the entire folder to a blending method. These apply to both conventional folders and groups, as well as animation folders. So use them to your advantage. Instead of using blending mode, still other people might want to shade via just normal colors. No blending required. Use what works for you, and what suits your style. Because shading is an arduous process, my style is not shading this animation. I just figured that people would probably want to know how to do shading if it came up. Otherwise, this animation is about done. I like to add a border effect on top of everything, so the easy way to do this is to put all the animation folders that are relevant into a single standard folder. I can then apply the outline effect to the parent folder, and it gives me this nice little black border. Looks beautiful. Kinda. It's still only a two hour animation, it's not something special. Lastly, when we're done with our animation, we want to make sure we can export it so we can put it in videos or into images and GIFs, and yes, it's pronounced GIF, fight me, so that way we can share it with the world. There's two ways you can do this. If you're a choosy artist that chooses GIF, you want to go to File, Export Animation, Export GIF. From here you can edit the settings as you need. The export tool in CSP is actually pretty solid, with low file sizes and good compression. Meanwhile, if you're making stuff for video, instead you're going to want to export this as an image sequence. Put the images in the folder of their own. These will be uncompressed PNGs, so they can have partial transparency, they will be lossless, and it's wonderful. You can import these files as an image sequence in the editor of your choice. This will turn it into a video file. Just be sure to reinterpret the footage if necessary, because if it is a different frame rate than the default of your regular project, it will play completely way too fast. I frequently have the issue of when I import image sequences into Premiere, even if it's a 12 frame per second animation, it will try to play at 30 frames per second. So I have to manually edit that. Now, if you want to animate better, I actually have another video on smooth animation that you should consider watching. You can also study the 12 principles of animation and work on practicing them in CSP. To end off this video though, I'm going to give just a few short tips. One, as I said, plan your stuff out, especially with sketches. Don't keyframe everything like it's a Zelda CDI animation. Minimize the number of keyframes that you need and work from there, getting the timing right before you proceed. Two, work in segments. Don't start with a full body on every single keyframe. While well, you might want to start with that on the first keyframe, start with just the heads in the preceding keyframes and then work on the bodies and then do the arms, etc. It's easier to keep things consistent when you're focusing on smaller parts. Naturally, you don't want to do this for literally everything, but it can be very helpful for both in-betweens and for doing some other keys. Three, observe the concepts of anticipation and overshoot as well as things like squash and stretch, the basic principles of animation. This will make your stuff look more organic and can create an illusion of smoothness even when you're animating super choppy or with minimal in-betweens. Four, please, for the love of God, simplify your character designs before you try animating them. High detail designs are going to send you directly to animation hell. I mean, I'm not going to stop you, but I'm just saying, if you're gonna do it, write your will before you start. Five, solid poses that you can hold in a timeline for a very long time will get you a lot of mileage. This is the strategy that a lot of anime uses. It'll save you a lot of time and a lot of work if you can just use one pose for a very long period instead of constantly switching between several other ones. And lastly, hotkeys. Use them. Seriously. I don't know why people don't. If it's not bound yet, consider binding the move forward and backwards one frame to something like comma and period. It will save you so much time. Learn the other hotkeys as well, please. 
Anyway, that's about it for this tutorial. There are other aspects of CSP that are very powerful, especially with animations, such as how it handles file objects and tweens. And yes, it can tween and actually can make rigs and stuff like that if you know how to use it right. These are way more advanced or niche cases, however, so I'm not going to cover them in this tutorial. I don't know if I will cover them in the future because at that point I would rather just use Flash or Toon Boom. I only use CSP occasionally for animation and instead prefer to stick to Toon Boom myself, but I really do not want to undersell how capable CSP is. Remember that one etchy anime that came out this year, Interspecies Reviewers? Guess what? That was made in CSP. Side note, it was really goddamn funny. Really horny, but really funny. With how accessible CSP is, anybody can get started animating for as little as $25 when it's on sale. Which is frequent, it's like every three months it goes on sale, just keep an eye out. Anyway, as mentioned, if you want more tutorials on animation, go check out some of my other stuff, and as always, thank you to my patrons for supporting my work.